Good evening. <laughs> Welcome to Epiphany Day, uh, the Feast of the Manifestation of Christ Jesus. And um, So we have our, our wise men have made it to the Nativity today. Um, so they are fully up there. We celebrate. I was asking somebody the other day if they knew who Melchior, Belshazzar, and Casper was, and not the friendly ghost. <laughs> the traditional names that, that go with the wise men. Of course, it's always uh, all these little quizzes that have, you know, do you know these facts about the story of the Christmas story and um, how many wise men are listed in the Bible? And people go, oh, three, three, three. Just says magi, just says wise men. It doesn't tell us how many there are. The only reason that we do three is because there are three gifts. Um, and so it's like, well, they just put one. But there could have been five of them bringing gold and four of them bringing frankincense. You know, we have no idea how many there were. One of them could have brought two gifts. <laughs> Don't know. Um, but... Uh, but this is the last day of Christmas time. This is technically the, the last day of Christmas. So, um, and you've probably seen before the um, lots of stories around the song 12 Days of Christmas. Um, and uh, some of the stories that started back in the, in the 80s, 90s, had it as a, a secret catechism about, well, that. No, it was actually just an old game that, that people would play. And, and so it would be each person would have to sing. And if you missed, as you would, so Amber would start off with the first three, and then Kelly would have to do those three plus the fourth one. And then Lisa would have to do the, and you have to do all the ones before. And if you messed up on it, then you had to pay a penalty. Um, and that might be uh, give a kiss or do something or you lost a trinket or something like that. But so it's a, a kid's game that would be played around uh, the Christmas tide. But this ends our Christmas tide, and, and then tomorrow begins the new season that we call Epiphany, uh, the, the season of Epiphany. Uh, today is technically, it's why it's still in white, because we're still in Christmas time. And then tomorrow the colors change to green. Um, Rhonda, would you go make a couple more copies real quick? Huh. It, or there's, Me and Mom can share. There's one more here. I can do the ones there. Let's see. Does anybody else need one? Somebody need one. If you don't need one, no, I don't need that one. Thank you. Ah, so, oh, me of little faith. How many I copy off and how many come in? That's always good. I like that. that more show up than you than you think. Um, so, uh, so our, our prayer this evening as we go through is a little different than what we have used before in the evening prayer. This is part of um, the, the daily office of prayers, but it, it comes from what's called the family version uh, of the daily office of prayers. And so uh, this is the, the one for early evening. Uh, that would be done before or after the evening meal, um, but before going to bed. So there, there's another set of prayers that's done right before bedtime. Uh, so just a little bit different, and um, so uh, we'd, we'd use this one uh, this evening. Let me just give you another style or form. How excellent is your mercy, O God! The children of men shall take refuge under the shadow of your wings, for with you it is the well of life, and in your light 
shall we see light. Psalm 36, verse 7 and 9. If you'll join me in responsive reading to O Gladsome Light. O Gladsome Light, pure brightness of the ever-living Father in heaven. O Jesus Christ, holy and blessed. Now we come to the setting of the sun, and our eyes behold the vesper light. We sing your praises, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy at all times to be praised by happy voices. O Son of God, O giver of life. And to be glorified through all the worlds. Our readings of scriptures this evening, I want to read both the Epiphany passage and then the passage that will go along with um, our words of endearment. Um, so reading from Matthew in the second chapter, verses 1 through 12. Reading from the English Standard Version. Matthew chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Behold, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, O and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country, by another way. Reading from the Gospel. And then turning to Exodus in the 19th chapter, and reading verses 3 through 8. Exodus chapter 19, beginning in verse 3. Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set them before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, 
I am coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe you forever. Word of the Lord. And then reading from Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, verse 24. And this time reading from the ink, these um, uh, contemporary English, but for the CEB. Deuteronomy 6, verse 24. The common English Bible. Common English Bible. The Lord commanded us to perform all these regulations, revering the Lord our God, so that things go well for us always, and so we continue to live as we're doing right now. The word of the Lord. Let's just pause for a moment to think about these words, both the, the message of the Magi and the message to, from uh, God to Moses in Exodus and Deuteronomy. Join me in responding together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church Universal, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So we take a moment to pause and pray. We want to remember those that we've been remembering, uh, particularly uh, to be thinking about the staff with Powhatan Elementary School as I put out the prayer request to be keeping uh, the three staff there that, the, um, that are affected with COVID and, and, and wives that are also, so there's five people uh, connected to the school and uh, just a lot of concern and stress over that uh, as that you keep them in prayer. Um, Diana goes in for her procedure on uh, cancer on, on her lip tomorrow and uh, not expecting any problem or concern from it uh, but uh, just keep her in prayer that it's just contained in a little bitty spot and they're able to go in and take that out and, and uh, just a couple of stitches and be done with it. And that's all that it is. Um, are there other prayer requests that we want to mention this, this evening? Donna. Hmm? Donna. Donna, yes. Donna's got her procedure um, tomorrow as well, so... Keep her in prayer. Um, we are new moms, and um, some she passed away. They're her family. Passed her family. Okay. So. Keep this. Okay. Keep this family in prayer and keep Alta, and, and she would recuperate and get strength. Remember, Mary also. Uh, he has to have surgery. It's scheduled for the 22nd, but right now a committee meets on Mondays to decide what surgeries are considered needful surgeries. They are going to have to cut him open. They can't do it laparoscopic. And he has two um, 
friends. Mm -hmm. I'm so tired. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> but but uh, pray that because he wants to have the surgery because it it needs done. Yeah. Um, and you know there are some risks. Just depends on our, our prayers. Yeah. But they'll the committee will okay it and he can get it done. Because he has been having Christmas Day. I thought I was going to have to take an emergency room because. Mm -hmm. But maybe had a blockage or something. Mm -hmm. He just was a lot of pain. Okay. I'm in prayer. Okay. Um, I know uh, Bill Moore had um, his brother-in-law who passed away last week, um, and, and there have been a couple of others around the community that have passed away recently. Uh, so keep these families. In any others? We've got a number of people that we've been remembering that are going through treatments with cancer. I want to continue to keep all of those in prayer. Keep wildlife in prayer as we start back tomorrow. Um, and just being able to minister to the kids and be able to, to give them hope and encouragement and strength in their lives. Let us pause and pray. Lord, we thank you for who you are and all that that means to us in our lives. Lord, you know each and every one of these circumstances. Lord, we ask your hand of grace and mercy and comfort in each and every circumstance. We ask that you would bring wisdom, that you would bring healing, your presence would be known in each person's life and through their lives that they might give testimony of your grace of their assurance of your presence Lord bring peace and hope Lord as we have come through this time of Christmas tide and think about all the things that your gift of love means in our lives. Lord, we ask that you would help us as we reach out in love to those around us by our words, by our actions, that we might show you and your presence in and through our lives. Lord, we think of our kids and the kids of our community. Lord, there are so many different trying circumstances and families and issues in their lives and questions and fears and doubts. Lord, we just pray that the wildlife can be a way to reach into their lives and show them of the, your reality what you mean in our lives, that they can know you, they can be strengthened by you. Lord, you know these that are going through treatments. Lord, we ask that you would continue to give healing and strength in their lives. Be with the doctors and nurses as provide care. Lord, keep each and every one safe. Lord, we don't know the answers for what this pandemic means and why and where it's all going to go. Lord, we want to, to know that you are present with us. That you might use each and every circumstance 
to give witness of you that your grace and power would be known that hearts and lives would turn to you Lord, we thank you that there are those who have worked for a vaccine and that that is available. And yet, Lord, we know ultimately with every situation that is in this world, when one disaster ends, another one comes. And so medicines are not the real and complete answer but to trust our lives in you. It's what we really need. That is the real health and salvation. That is the joy that you bring, and the hope that you bring, that we might know life everlasting in you. Lord, that's not a cop-out. It is an assurance that there is more in life than this world. Guide and direct us that our lives would be true to you in all that we do and all that we say. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. If you'll join with me in praying the words that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, before we will we'll use the, the collect at the end, I um, want to go back and, and look at these words that are from Exodus and Deuteronomy, and uh, they were used in the opening uh, introductory chapter in the book, Words of Endearment, as we want to be looking at um, these lessons and what God wants to say to us uh, over the next 12 weeks. Encourage and hope that you will read along each week um, uh, the, the chapter and uh, so that you can bring insights and thoughts uh, with that uh, as we come together in Wednesday night. So just to, to start off, when you think about the Ten Commandments, what images, what ideas come to your mind? What do you think about when you hear the Ten Commandments? Guidelines. Guidelines? Okay. God's love, okay. Mm -hmm. Power. Okay, the, it off the mountain. Yeah, when we think about those words from Exodus, and um, you know, there is a lot uh, around that story as Moses goes up, and the thundering, and the lightning, and the cloud, and all of those things. The voice of the Lord, and. And it tells us that the people were sorely afraid. Uh, the power of God is evident in that. Um, yeah. Even when we think about those tablets, you know, maybe that's an image when we think about we think about the the tablets that are there. Um, God did the writing. Huh? God did the writing. And God doing the writing of that. Yeah. Um, which I should have brought in, I'll have to, to bring it in. I've got a little uh, 
image of those stone of the tablets in there, uh, old plaque, and, and bring that in to keep that in front of us as we think about that. I always thought about how when Moses came off that mountain, how he must have felt so betrayed by the people that everyone turned their backs. Yeah. On him and the Lord. And so, yeah. Yeah, the passage that we read from Exodus, they all say, oh, we'll do it, we'll do it. And then when Moses comes back down after 40 days, they build a golden calf. And I mean, they, how quickly? You know, oh, how quickly? Over and over again, we see that in, in the people, and, and we want to chastise them about how quick. But then we think, oh, well, how quickly sometimes we've forgotten. Mm-hmm done things as well yeah so um, if you read the chapter uh, at the beginning of the chapter uh, dad talks about uh, the Decalogue uh, being a Greek word and and, uh, Decalogue means yeah ten commandments or or ten words in Greek the Deca is ten and log When we think of uh, John 1.1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The word there in Greek is logos. So deca, loga, decalogue, is ten words. Um, So we get, get that image. And the first purpose of the decalogue uh, is to reveal God himself. To reveal the nature, the character of God. Um, To reveal his moral and spiritual photograph. So that when we think about the Ten Commandments, in a way, when we look at those, they're a picture of God himself. They reveal who God is. What God does. How God thinks and how God acts. And how God created us to be. Because we are created to be in the image of God. And we're to reflect God. When we use the word Christian, we're to be like Christ. We're to be like God. Uh, We're to reflect his his image. Now the, the title that Dad uses for the book, Words of Endearment. And uh, it's an interesting concept that he brings out. When we think of endearment, we tend to think of the meaning that came out of the 18th century. And and somebody that is endearing. What do you think of? If I say that Rhonda is endearing to me, what does that mean? Well, take the little word. Ron is always telling her students, look for the little words, dear, and not that little four-legged creature. It's D-E-A-R, not D-E-E-R. So what is, if I say that she's a deer, what does that mean? She's a sweetie, okay? So we think of love. Think of love. And so the word endearment came to be an expression of love. Except if we go back earlier to the 17th century and before, the word endearment meant an obligation of gratitude. So not an expression of love, love, but an obligation to show gratitude. And Martin Buber, a Jewish theologian philosopher, said that the Ten Commandments don't tell what I must not do, but what I will not do as a believer. Is there a difference between those two statements? What I must not do and what I will not do. 
Right. One's, the first part is a sense of obligation. The second part is a sense of my choice, my desire to not do that. And so when we think of the, the Ten Commandments, Kelly said that she thought of guidelines. The Ten Commandments can also be seen as a set of boundaries, as guidelines. Rather than seeing them as rules, as do-nots, to see them as a guideline, a boundary. And that, that boundaries, and it seems contradictory in, in our thinking, that boundaries give freedom. Permissiveness does not give freedom. Letting a person do what they want to do is not freedom. But giving them boundaries so that they can live is free. Every child wants to know what the boundaries are. When they know what the boundaries are, they can live in that, and they actually have freedom. When we know what our boundaries are, we are actually the freest. And uh, for those that were around this church many years ago, when Chick Schaefer was here, he probably told this illustration of when he was a boy, he had an aquarium. And... As he would care for, he would, he really cared for his fish. And he even had his own little worm farm to grow his own fish food. So he grew his own worms and made his own fish. And he would check the pH level. He would check the air level in his tank. He would make sure that it was cleaned out. He, he did all the things to make sure it was the best environment for that tank. But he said, one day, the catfish got all the other fish down in by the castle and told them that Charlie was holding out on them. That Charlie did things that they didn't get to do. Charlie was the free one, and they weren't free. And now the fish said, well, what do you think we ought to do? And they eat. The catfish said, I think we ought to get out of this tank. And they go, well, I don't know. Charlie's pretty good to us. He cleans our tank. He makes sure the air's good. He feeds us well. The catfish says, nope, Charlie's holding out on us. There's stuff out there that Charlie's denying us. I don't care about y'all, but I'm getting out of here. So the catfish backed up in the corner, swam real hard, and jumped out of the tank. And all the other fish flew over the side, or swam over the side and looked out the tank and said, Wow, he's free. And they saw the catfish flapping around on the ground. And they looked, wow, he's free. Now watch him. A little bit longer, catfish even flopping so much. And then the club. And the other fish looked at each other and says, I think we'll stay in the tank. Boundaries let us live life the way that we're meant to be able to live it. When we bust out the boundaries, we bring disaster upon ourselves. God has created boundaries, guidelines for us so that we can know freedom. My dad and I used to really enjoy the cartoon strip called Calvin and Hobbes. I don't know if you ever read it, but uh, Calvin and Hobbes, Calvin played this game in there and it was called Calvin Ball. And in Calvin Ball, there were no boundaries. There was no out of bounds. It kind of played like football, then sometimes it played like baseball. And, so, 
and the rules always change. As soon as Hobbes would say, oh, you can't do that, Calvin would say, oh, no, I changed the rules. Calvin Ball led to chaos and disaster because then something would happen and Calvin would get hurt and he'd realize, oh, my own rules caused a problem for me. But God has given us a set of boundaries, the Ten Commandments, they're a guide to us. And so that a, a good parenting Godly parenting is about teaching children what their boundaries are, how to live a good and healthy and safe life. What is good to eat, what is not good to always eat. Now, Bill Cosby said that chocolate cake was good for breakfast because it had eggs and flour and milk in it and all of that. But a diet of chocolate cake for breakfast isn't really a healthy diet. We teach kids these are what is good to eat. You need your vegetables. You need your... I don't like vegetables. You need your vegetables. You need a balance of things. Things in the right balance, in the right, right way, give a healthy life. So God has created a set of guidelines for us, a set of boundaries in the Ten Commandments. And so the, the, the first purpose of the Ten Commandments is to show us who God is and how we are to be a reflection of the image of God himself. And then the Ten Commandments, as the Decalogue, is to show us about a covenant relationship with God. God loves us. For God so loved the world, well, we know John 3, 16, but actually we can go back to Exodus 20 and to uh, Deuteronomy 5. God so loved the world that he gave 10 commandments. God showed us himself. He showed us what it is to live in relationship with him. And so the Ten Commandments help form character. They help form us in the way that we will live a healthy and good life. And so that we don't obey the Ten Commandments because they're laws, but because we love the giver of the Ten Remember Rhonda telling our kids one time that, or many times, one day I hope that you'll obey me, not because you think you won't get in trouble, but you'll obey me because you love me. And that's what it is to follow the Ten Commandments, because we love God. Fidelity in the marriage is not because we made a vow at the wedding or because we'll end up getting a divorce. We don't commit adultery because we love our spouse. Not because we'll get in trouble. We do it because we love. And that's what the Ten Commandments are about. These things are a reflection of loving God. Back to what Martin Buber said, it's not what I must not do, it's what I will not do because of the relationship that we have with God. A number of years ago, I remember a, a rabbi telling me that there is a difference between doing Torah, which is the law, and living Torah. So there's a lot of people who do Torah. They, you know, I don't do this, I don't do that, I don't do this, I don't do that. We used to use the old statement, you know, I don't drink, I don't cuss, I don't smoke, and I don't go with girls who do. You know, it's not about 
all the things that I don't do. It's about loving God, the giver of law, that I want to reflect God in my life. If the Ten Commandments are the moral and spiritual photograph of God, I want to reflect God to other people. And I want to reflect it to God himself. To be a godly person means God is in me so much that God sees himself in me. When I look in the mirror or when God looks at me, God sees himself. So that we begin to be more and more godly, godlike, or as we come to the New Testament, to be Christ-like, to take on the character of God himself. So we don't just do the Torah, we live it because we love the God who has given us himself. He's given us his words. I like the, the statement at the end of the chapter. It, it reflects back into the New Testament and the rich young man who came to Jesus and asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And um, you know, I, I, Dad's comment, he says, I, I want Jesus to say, repent and get saved. Repent and believe. That's how you get eternal life. Come to the altar, say the sinner's prayer, and then you get eternal life. But that's not what Jesus says. Jesus asks him, do you know the commandments? Do you know the commandments? And, and the man misunderstands the whole thing and thinking, oh yeah, I've done those all my life. He's done them. But he hasn't lived them. And Jesus is trying to get him to think about what later he says in Matthew, the 22nd chapter. What is the greatest commandment of all commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. How do you know if you love God? Love your neighbor. The Ten Commandments, as we'll look at and see, the first part of them, the first four, talk about our relationship with God, and the next six reflect how we love our neighbor. And our spouse or anybody else, how we relate to other people. How do we love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength? We live like God does. We allow the character, the nature of God to be present within us. And by doing that, we show how much we love God. How much do I love Rhonda? Well, it's not just do I buy her this or do this or do that or how many times I say I love you. But it's how I live in relationship even when she's not around. Think about that. How we love our spouse has to do what we say and do when they're not even around to see and hear it. Rhonda used to talk about, years ago, she did not like going to the teacher's lounge. She said, all they talk about is negative stuff about their husbands and their boyfriends. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to be around that. You know, what do we talk about our spouses, our family, when they're not present? Reflects what we truly think and believe about them. 
if they're a mean, ugly, scuzz bucket, when they're not around, that means that's what we think they are when they are around. How we regard them, how we talk about them to others is how we will, in fact, treat them when they are present. How we think about God, how we talk about God when God isn't present or we're not present in church reflects what we really think about God. How we live out our lives 24-7, 365, is more a reflection of our relationship with God than whether or not we are at church. It's do we demonstrate the nature, the character of God in our life all the time? That is the mark of loving God. So there, at the end of each of the chapters, there's uh, a couple of questions to think about. Uh, start off with the first one. Um, how does obeying God's words help us to understand his love and show his love for him? I commented about some of that, so you can spit it back at me if you want. Uh, or how do you think about that? How does loving, how does obeying God's words Help us to under his, understand his love for us and show his love. Yeah, so it's not, you know, I think if we think of obeying as being living up to a rule, then it gets hard. But if we think of obeying as trusting, believing, living the way that he wants, that's how I show the law. Um, Starting from brain Just that, that caring. Uh, I want to show them that love, but that's because of God loves me that much. Right. Yeah. God loves us enough to give us guidelines. Yeah, I feel like that, that God has, when you're living your life in God's will, His, His word, and you're making this decision saying, you know, this is what I'm going to live. I'm going to live my life the way God wants me to. This is what God wants. And the more you do that, the more you, you let God take over, then your life is being, it's being fulfilled more and more and more. There's more peace there. Yeah. Um, there's more the patience. Things that things don't matter. But the worry disappears. And you, you're not even aware of it. Yeah. If you let yourself go with God and just think I mean, we're not perfect. I know that. I'm no. not perfect. I, I'm not yeah. sure about it. I know that all I need to do is continue to do my best and, and just pray to God and just thank Him. And He will fill me. He, he's with me all the time. Yeah. And I don't worry about things. Yeah. I'm not, you know. I'm not, so that we're making know, that choice. Yeah, I know there's things out there that's, you know, like the world around us is falling apart. There's nothing I can do about it. These are decisions that people make. But my decision is, I know God's going to take care of us. He's going right. to take care of me. And I just pray for his hand to shield, you know, to shield us from all that. Right. And, I, and that's the way I feel. Is yeah. If I just continue to do my best and live his word as much as I can, he'll just, he'll just take care of me. Yeah. And knowing that his caring for us is for eternity, not just for this moment. That's why it's not giving us all that we want right now. 
doesn't mean that it's why it's like, well, we'll just ask God to heal us of everything. Well, eventually that I mean that you know, we don't live to be a hundred, two hundred, three hundred, four hundred, five hundred, six hundred, eight hundred, nine hundred years anymore. I don't know that I want to live that long when as one old guy told me, it's like, I know Jesus. Why am I worried about whether I live six more months to get to be a hundred when I get to be with him for eternity? <laughs> and that goes back to the relationship. You know, if you want to have a relationship with someone, you spend time together. And that's the way it is with God. I want to spend time reading his word. I want to spend time. Yeah. We time. want to know more and more about him because of the relationship with him. Yeah. Which which goes with the, the next question. What does it mean to have an ongoing walk with God? No, oh, that's fine. Lisa was answering that too. You know, both of those answers fit right in with that. By doing each and every day, listening, learning, following in his way. to think about how has the Decalogue throughout history affected cultures? Yeah, you go to the Supreme Court, it's up there on the wall. Yep, engraved in the stone. Yeah. Just about every civilization that has laws those laws are related in some way, shape, or form to the Ten Commandments. Some of those laws, they're, they're, they're driven from that because they're the moral reflection of God. And they've been placed upon our moral, if we're in a moral society, then we're going to have those laws, those principles, those guidelines the way that we live our lives, I wanted to reflect that. Um, yeah. Sometimes, though, you know, we see more and more how we're departing from some of that. That's when decision comes to play. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, do we allow culture to continue to... Uh, fall apart in that, you know. So it's important, I mean, how we vote, and how, not whether you vote Republican or Democrat, but that we vote according to who is holding up those kind of principles that we want to put forward. Um, I, I, I want a congressman who knows that a woman is not a word. <laughs> And it's not the opposite or the inclusion of amen. <laughs> that amen is not a gender term. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, I was telling somebody uh, today. There are two words that are the same in every language, and they originate from Hebrew. Amen and hallelujah. Amen means so be it. And hallelujah means praise to God. Praise to the Lord. They're the same in every language around the world. They've never been translated. They come, But they come out of that original, out of Hebrew. Um, so reflecting again. The word of God is pervasive across cultures, across languages. And we can see God's handprint upon cultures by how it lives its life, how it lives, how it conducts itself in society. So uh, encourage you as we, we look along at these uh, words and uh, the, the first word of the, the commandments of the the words of endearment. And, I, and hopefully that becomes a, 
an impression about these instead of seeing them as commands but we see them as the revelation of God's love we see them as God's endearment towards us in these words that we might live our lives in relationship with him hmm? do I need to order more Chong doesn't have one yet. Okay. Hmm? So I need to order a couple more. Okay. You order a couple more. I'll get on. I'll do that when we get home. Um, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Is there anybody else here that has not gotten one? Okay. So we'll, we'll get a couple more. And, Get those out ASAP. Um, so that you'll have you hopefully get those, and so you can get them to be able to read the the first read that chapter before next Wednesday. So, well, let us uh, close in prayer. We're going to use this collect this prayer for the day of Epiphany. Oh God, by the leading of a star, you manifest your only Son to peoples on the earth. Lead us, who know you by, now by faith, to your presence, where we might see your glory face to face. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I know that's not the colic that you have printed on yours because I gave you the one that's just a generic colic that you might use with it. And I used the one that was for epiphany. Because you're not going to use that one except till another epiphany. So, you can, yeah, yeah.